I wanted to start today by having everyone take a second and close their eyes and visualize what a person looks like when I describe them as homeless. What comes to mind? What is their age? You can open your eyes back up, but I want you to consider, does their outward appearance depict their housing status? Well, what if I were to tell you that I was homeless? And Father Curry kind of gave that away. Um, <laughs> and while I know that many of you were not considering or imagining someone as good looking as me, <laughs> just kidding, I know that this is a really serious topic. I just wanted to break the ice so that we can get started today. Now, when I discuss or describe homeless youth, I'm referring to a population of youth who live away from their parents or legal guardians in often unstable or inadequate living situations. These youth are invisible to society. This is because they live in very unique places. And these places include shelters, cars, friends' couches, or simply the streets. And while I wasn't on the streets, I was homeless. I absolutely hated the term. I was never comfortable with it. I would have never said in Gaston, Gaston stage that I was homeless, ever. But I was. I come from an area outside San Francisco, California. And this area experiences a struggle. Everyone has their story. And now, my story started my freshman year of high school when my parents got a divorce. After my parents' separation, it was me, my mother, and my sister in our home. Until at the end of my freshman year, we received a knock on the door. A policeman. A policeman informing that my home, my home that my parents had worked my entire life for, was foreclosed. We didn't have a roof. We didn't know where to go. And we had seven days to vacate the property. You know, thinking back, my, I thought, nothing of it. My mom was Wonder Woman. And being the feminist that she brought me up to be, I knew that she could handle it, and I knew that she would find a place immediately for my sister and I. And so began a few days of crashing on friends' couches. Once again, not thinking anything of it, it's just one big slumber party. But my mom came through. She found a home for us on the other side of a tracks in a rougher part of the neighborhood. She commuted six hours a day to ensure that my sister and I had a roof over our head and food on the table. We were five minutes from our high school, and this was imperative because my mom wanted to ensure that me and my sister would continue our education. So life continued. Our home was beautiful. I had a roof. It was a good time. It was those teenage adolescent years, you know, like when you're really um, just a teenager. And uh, good time. And you know, laughs were shared. Friends were made. And bills piled up. And it wasn't until my junior year when I attended this program called Boys Nation. And at this program, youth were told to make mock legislation for Congress that really meant a lot to them. And so my naive young self set off on this, this idea of making something, focusing on housing reform. I wanted to focus on housing reform because I wanted there to be some type of security for families who were evicted or had form, homes foreclosed on them. This trip was life-changing. I came to the Capitol. We were hosted in the White House with President Obama, and it was absolutely life-changing. I came home to my community reinvigorated to make a, make a difference. I was so excited just to do something. But then something happened to where I couldn't. Those next four weeks were more formidable than that week that I spent in DC doing mock legislation. I came home to another knock on the door another pink note, and another eviction. It was in this moment I saw my mom, the strongest woman I have ever known, the woman who got us back into another home, who commuted six hours a day to work, who loved me, cry. We had no options. We had nowhere to go. And so the boat sank, and our family was surfing taking it wave by wave 
day by day and couch by couch until there was a significant drop in my academic performance. I went from being at the top of my class to a truant. I never went to school. All that I worried about was trying to survive. I would worry about where I would sleep that night, what I would eat, and it came down to even the basic necessities of finding change to wash mine and my sister's clothes for that week. These were the things that consumed my, senior, my junior year of high school. This is what I thought of. On top of that, when I was at school, I never turned in an assignment. My whole demeanor and outlook on life changed. I had no access to my textbooks or computer, and I wasn't the Jimmy that many of you would know. But my school took action. They've noticed. They noticed Jimmy wasn't doing as well as he could. And so what happened was is they called me into the principal's office where I broke down in tears describing what was happening with my family. They immediately took action. What they did was they ensured, they had one administrator ensure that my sister and I were fed and healthy, one administrator to pay for our doctor's bills, while another community member took my sister in. I was taken in by my best friend's teacher in economics, te and my best friend's father in economics teacher, Fidel Garcia. I stayed in his home for the next three and a half months. I stayed in a room that was meant for a teenage girl. But I was forever grateful that bed, even though it had pink sheets, was just so comforting. Staying in that home, I was grateful. But still, I was homeless. Because the thing is, is that I sat at that dinner table that didn't include my family. I celebrated my 17th Thanksgiving and 17th birthday, homeless and away from my mother and sister. I spent those three and a half months worrying every day how my sister was doing, if she was secure, if someone was loving her, paying attention to her, if she was making it to basketball practice. I spent those, next, those three and a half months worrying about being a burden in someone else's home. Now, my community definitely supported me, and they took care of me and made sure that I was fed and healthy and clothed. But they also encouraged me to pursue my dreams. You see, I wasn't thinking about college. And this was the college application process this whole time. I wasn't thinking about college, because all I was trying to do was survive. And so with the finances of my community, they pushed me to take the SAT the last possible chance. They pushed me to apply to university's deadlines the day after. They pushed me to pursue my dream of going to a four-year college. And they also pushed me to graduate from high school. I ended up graduating from high school as, my valedict as our valedictorian and student body president. I also graduated high school knowing that I would come to Georgetown University, my dream school. And so now that you know my story, you'll know, you would know that during the thick of it, I never, never accepted the term homeless. I would have never accepted that. Because to accept that term would have been, would have been shameful to my family. To accept that term would have meant I fit, fit some type of conception that society has made over the word homeless, right? So whatever you guys conceived in this, at the beginning, I would never want my family to be thought of in, that, passion, in that, that light or in that picture, right? I didn't accept the term because I didn't want to invite pity on me. I didn't want to be a charity case. I didn't want to be known as Jimmy the homeless kid when I was so much more than that. I didn't accept the term homeless because it was shameful to me. And then I realized that it didn't have to be. I came to Georgetown University, and I was confronted with this notion of contemplation and action. As most Georgetown students are, I was prompted to look within myself, to reflect on my experience and reflect on who I am. Oh, sorry, Mike. And, and through this reflection, I found that I was putting on a facade by not acknowledging my struggle and by not being outward with who I was, I was missing a huge part of who I was, of who I am. I was masking my shame and I was not being a whole person for others. And then my process continued into my freshman year Justice and Peace Studies course. We did, we researched a number of social justice issues and one of those issues was homelessness. I found that my story fit the textbook definition. 
And while I found that my peers were really excited to make a difference and to learn about homelessness, there was a fundamental inability for them to connect to the issue. And so after much contemplation and thinking about it, I decided to come out with my story and tell them of my housing situation. My peers were better able to connect with the issue. I found that my story was not something to be shameful of, but rather it was a tool, it was a blessing in disguise and something that allowed me to give a voice to the voiceless. And finally, I was able to come to terms with my shame because of the people that I've surrounded myself with and the people who have loved me and gotten me to this point. My state of homelessness could not be attributed to one factor or person. Similarly, my success and my ability to confront my shame cannot be attributed to one person or institution. I wish I can say that I got up here and that I'm here at Georgetown because of what I did and because of everything that I did. I wish I could say that I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, but that's not the case. I'm here because of my friends who gave me couches to sleep on, my community who fed me and encouraged me to follow my dreams, my sister who's kept a smile on my face since day one, the Georgetown community who's given me a home on the hilltop, and finally, my mother and father who have instilled in with me this idea of living fearlessly, loving fearlessly, and getting up whenever knocked down. And I found that these people and communities never once allowed my homeless status to affect our relationship, right? I found this courage through them to accept my shame. To them, I was never a charity case, but rather I was Jimmy, that chubby, that chubby Mexican kid with the ridiculous smile. They accepted me for me, and they allowed me to confront my shame and own it. No label can define who I was because those people loved me for who I, for who I was. And by owning it, owning this idea of being homeless, owning my shame, I was able to go forth and make a difference. So today, I serve as a consultant for the California Homeless Youth Project. And what we do is we empower youth to own this label. We empower them to go forward and share their stories with policymakers and speak candidly about this issue that a lot of people don't think exists. And what we found is that by having our state confront its own shame, we found that they're now willing to make a change and make a difference. And so from these stories and from these experiences that these youth have shared, we have found, we have developed this state plan that encompasses all their stories. And this state plan is the nation's first ever state plan to end youth homelessness. And what it has done is generated eight different laws, eight different bills that have gone through the state legislator. It's gone through the state legislator with bipar unanimous bipartisan support. Six of these laws have been giant, signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown. While we all have some type of label society puts on us, it is important for us to own it. These labels can often be shameful, and our fear to own them can stem from the idea of it allowing it to define us. But I found that the second we attempt to mask this shame, or allow the label to define who we are, we lose ourselves in the ability to generate change in the process. I'm not telling you to go forward and introduce yourself with your deepest, darkest secret and your deepest shame. What I am telling you is that there's something incredibly beautiful and innately powerful about owning whatever society tells you or tells you is wrong about you. It is through this process of owning it, reflecting, and educating ourselves, we can go forward, confront our change, and make a difference. And so I stand before you boldly, proudly, and unashamed to tell you, yes, I was homeless. This was my shame. It is my story. And now it is up to me and you and all of the change makers of this world to ensure that every child has a home and that one day, the word homeless will disappear from our dictionaries. Thank you.